Okay, so that's wrong. We're back on. Good afternoon, everyone. It's 2 o'clock. We'll get started here in a couple minutes. Let everybody get situated and 
wait for a few more people to either call in or join in through the webinar. Okay, everyone, a few minutes after 2 o'clock, we'll get started here. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the latest information on the COVID-19 virus. Joining us today is Brenda Brennan with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and Larry Horvath with the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. I'm Melissa Samuel, president of HCAM. We have uh, all the HCAM staff with us here today on the call to assist. But specifically, I want to mention Kathleen Sunlin, our VP of Regulatory Services, who is our main lead on the COVID virus here at the association. Let me mention a few housekeeping issues before we start. If you are signed in through the webinar and have questions you'd like to submit, please click on the chat box and then click on the all panelists and attendees to type in your questions. We will take questions um, following Brenda's presentation and try to answer those specifically to the health and human services side. And then we'll have Larry present and we will take further questions on the um, regulatory survey side of this issue. And then of course, any additional questions that, that you do want to ask. Um, we will read them as they come in, and then between Brenda, Larry, and staff, we will hopefully be able to answer all of them. If you are just calling in and you do have questions, um, please send them to info at hcam.org following the call, and we will then compile all of the questions asked during the webinar and any follow-on questions uh, we will compile all of that um, Q&A and post that back out to the HCAM website as well as a recording of today's conference call. So with that, let me introduce uh, both Brenda and Larry. Brenda Brennan is the HAI coordinator, coordinator uh, and SHARP Unit Manager for the Department of Health and Human Services. Brenda is the co-lead on the state's COVID-19 activities. She is overseeing the clinical and lab portion as well as coordinating all communications and work between our public health department and local public health departments. Larry Horvath is the Director of the Bureau of Community and Health Systems. Larry oversees the state licensing and federal certification regulatory duties. The Bureau programs are designed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of individuals receiving care, care services uh, through various, various covered, licensed, certified provider types. With that, we're going to have um, Brenda start on the, again, health and human service 
side of the COVID-19 virus. All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Brenda Brennan. I'm an HAI coordinator. Um, I actually sit within the Communicable Disease Division of um, the Department of Health and Human Services. So we are over in the Bureau of Epidemiology. So my training is actually in epidemiology. And uh, when it comes to this response, I am just one spoke in a very big wheel. Um, there's many different um, groups responding to this right now at the state level, and ours just happens to be the epi side, but we do coordinate with other sides, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, I won't go over all the clinical details of COVID-19. I'm sure you're probably familiar with that. I think I'll just give you kind of a quick bird's eye view of uh, what's happening globally, and then in the United States, and then here in Michigan, and kind of just going into um, how we're responding here um, in the state, and then followed up with some um, long-term care guidance that's out there as well as some other guidance that CDC has been putting out and then maybe go into some uh, PPE uh, supply issues. So just to give you kind of a bigger picture as of today, we were over 110,000 cases um, from 109 countries and we have about 3,400 deaths associated with that. Um, 80,000 of that is still in mainland China and China has been doing, they haven't been increasing as much as they have been. But we are seeing some dramatic increases now in South Korea, Iran, Italy, um, Germany's increasing, and now France and Spain as well. Here in the United States, we are up to 566 confirmed cases. That's throughout 34 different states reporting at least one case. And we have 22 deaths here um, in the United States. When we come back closer to Michigan and what we're doing, um, as of right now, we have a little over 27 persons under investigation um, that met criteria. Um, 18 of those individuals have tested negative, and we have nine pending results right now. So, um, as you can imagine, this response has been, um, we've been through a couple. We've been through H1N1, we've been through Zika, we've been through a couple. But this one has been very challenging, that's moving very, very fast, and there's a lot of different pieces at the federal and state level. Um, one thing that happened very early on, which I'm sure you probably heard through the news, is as travelers were coming in through mainland China, they were being filtered through 11 different airports. Detroit Metro was one of those. And every day we would receive um, referrals of these individuals that were coming in. So they had China on their itinerary at some point. Um, we got the referral. So we have a little over 440, little over 440 individuals that are into our... Outbreak management system. So that's part of our Michigan disease surveillance system, which is a web-based um, system that we actually track not viable diseases. So we have 440 that have come in through a little over um, 332 different flights um, and a couple cruise ships. Um, so those individuals come to our attention and those referrals um, get notified to our local health department. So we try to figure out the best we can with the information we're given where these individuals actually reside, and that gets referred to our local health department. So out of those 440 that have come through, um, some of those are also self-reported, so they have had travel and they just, for whatever reason, didn't get caught, and they've come to the attention of self-reported to either us or the local health department. But we have a, roughly about 88 individuals who are actively being monitored right now um, across the state. And hopefully you knew on uh, February 3rd, our Community Health Emergency Coordination Center was activated, and that's over in um, the Bureau of Trauma, Emergency, and Preparedness, um, which is our sister bureau. And then on the 28th, our State Emergency Operations Center was activated to help this. Um, so just to give you a peek of what, um, as, as you're probably very well aware, we have meetings every day, but we do have an internal meeting every day where um, epidemiology talks with laboratory, we talk with communications, we talk with BTEP, which is sort of trauma emergency and preparedness, um, legal, we're talking to Medicaid, and a whole bunch of groups are, ta are talking at least every day and sharing information of what's going on and challenges we're seeing and things that we need to relay to each group and whatnot. So. Throughout the response, um, various things have changed. I won't go through what all the various protocols are, but as of right now, um, as you probably heard, um, our testing has been ramped up and our Bureau of Labs can indeed test for COVID-19. And um, LabCorp and Quest have also um, come online as of today. So the flow of what it should be as of right now, um, that healthcare providers 
um, can now um, offer to do that test, and the testing will either come through um, Bureau of Labs here at the State Public Health Lab, or through, um, actually come through there, so providers will call their local health department, and the local health department's job is to basically screen and make sure that these people do indeed have symptoms, um, if there's any other rule out of their, their respiratory illness, so are they positive for influenza or positive for something else, um, kind of go over what their travel history is, and then kind of look and see what their um, exposure history is, any of the local EPIs. As of right now in Michigan, we don't have any confirmed cases. Um, so the local health department would actually enter that into our Michigan disease surveillance system and they actually get a number. So um, those specimens will be going to the lab. And if you're curious about which specimens those are, those are NP swabs or OP swabs, and you can also submit a sputum. Um, these go in like a viral transport media. And those are sent on ice packs, and the local health department will be able to guide you through that. Um, at the state level, too, uh, we every day, oh, let's see, every Tuesday at 10 a.m., we have um, health care calls. So BTEP puts those on for health care facilities where we basically go over um, travel monitoring, we go over laboratory updates, we go over guidance, um, communications, and any legal issues. And then on Fridays, we talk to local health departments, so they're at 2 p.m., um, where all the local health departments can call in. We kind of give civil information and kind of direct them through any of the, the monitoring and movement of um, PUIs and um, how that flow should go. So the caveat being, all of this is very, very fluid. It changes almost daily. Um, so we're just trying to get a handle on everything that comes down from CDC and then what comes down to the state and what we have to relay to all of our healthcare partners and our local health department par partners. Um, all right, on March 4th, um, Dr. Caldoun and Linda Scott from BTEP did send out a letter to long-term care facility directors, um, basically saying um, start preparing now um, and looking at you know, preventing the introduction of respiratory illness into your facility. And a lot of the guidance that you'll see on CDC's website does say basically um, prepare as you would for influenza. This is a respiratory virus. Um, there are some nuances, but for the most part, you're still trying to do the same thing. You're trying to prevent the spread. You're going to identify PPE you have available. You want prompt identification and isolation of these folks so that it doesn't go throughout the facility. Um, and then it does stay in there to review contingency and crisis standards of care as a plan, um, monitor and manage, manage any healthcare personnel that might be exposed, and then basically just keep your residents and your employees informed. Um, so that letter went out, and I think there's other um, guidance and whatnot that is coming down. Um, BTEP, along with communications, is writing a lot of that, that coordinated piece and, and guidance that goes outward to partners. So our job in the Bureau of Epi is more um, dealing with the persons under investigation and answering infection prevention control guidance type questions. Um, a couple things I wanted to bring up as far as guidance. Uh, the disclaimer being CDC changes a lot of these guidance um, without really telling you. So you make sure that you're always looking at the top of the page and trying to see what the most updated version of that guidance is. Um, they don't always summarize what they've changed. So a lot of times it's a scavenger hunt and trying to figure out what exactly they've changed. They're starting to be a little bit better about that. And as far as the clinical guidance, they've been really, really good. So maybe there's some focus on physicians and make sure they know what's going on. Um, some cool things that they've added recently in the past week, um, one of the categories, and hopefully you've all been to the CDC COVID-19 website. On the left-hand side, there's a whole bunch of um, different um, areas that you can um, click on and it'll, they basically expand out and cascade down. Things that they've recently added um, is under the Preventing COVID Spread in Communities tab. They've put in guidance there for at home. That's where your K through 12 and your school program guidance is, at college and universities, at work community and faith-based organizations, large community event mass gatherings, healthcare settings, first responders, and even they have election, election and polling centers. So if you want to check out any of that guidance, that is where it resides on that tab. Um, just this weekend, they actually added people at higher risk and special populations. Um, so the high risk group, they put people as older adults and then people with heart disease, diabetes, and lung disease, and then it kind of goes through uh, things that pertain to that group. And then they also have a special populations tab, so it's for pregnant women. And if you go into there, it goes into um, breastfeeding and also has frequently asked questions for children, because a lot of people are very worried about children. Um, looking at a lot of the literature, though, what you see is that 80% of 
people have a very mild, if not moderate, um, presentation of illness, and it's mostly affecting, um, I guess, severe-wise, um, 70 years and plus. So children, are, they're getting very, they're asymptomatic, if not mild illness, but um, please check out those frequently asked questions if you do have specifics on, on children. Um, let's see. Some, uh, okay, so the main page for healthcare professionals, um, they've added a lot of, of lot of things in there, but that's where you're actually going to find your infection prevention um, recommendations, and they'll have, they also have frequently asked questions for infection control in there. Um, that's where you find your clinical care. Um, it has strategies for optimizing supply of N95 respirators. I'm going to go over one of those in a second. It has the risk assessment for public health management of healthcare personnel. This recent um, this guidance has changed recently just to, as we're getting more and more healthcare workers that are being affected, being exposed, um, how to triage those and um, figure out what their exposure is and their risk. Um, it has preparedness resources, so it has a healthcare providers checklist as well as hospital preparedness tools. Um, implementing home care, so preventing the spread in your home, and then disposition of patients, um, healthcare supply, and then additional frequently asked questions for healthcare professionals. They also have tabs for health departments and whatnot, but that's the main lane that um, we'll talk about today. For long-term care facilities, this tab's actually recent, it's probably about two weeks old or so, um, but it will go through its three main pieces, um, basically steps healthcare facilities can take now to prepare for corona or COVID-19. So a lot of these are very general as far as um, basically being prepared, staying informed about the local epi in your area. And you can do that by visiting um, michigan.gov slash coronavirus to get the Michigan scape or um, CDC's webpage. Um, develop and renew your facility's emergency plan. Establish relationships with key healthcare and public health partners in the community. So basically this one is just know the phone numbers that you need and who to contact. If you have any questions um, in your public health department or um, within your association, and then creating that emergency contact list, um, communicate with staff and patients. So it's really important that not only do um, patients, residents, or whatnot, they, they understand what's going on and they understand what staff are going to do, and then basically training staff so staff know what the policies are and if those policies have to be um, more flexible to account for any illness or um, what happens if you're, you don't have enough staff to cover certain shifts, all of that has to take into account basically protecting your workforce and protecting your patients. Um, the second piece would be strategies to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities. So this one basically goes over preventing the introduction of the respiratory um, disease like into your facility and that goes within your facility and then between facilities. So it kind of teases out um, in different bullet points, um, things to consider and things that you should start um, implementing at this point. There's also interim guidance for healthcare facilities preparing for community transmission of COVID-19 in the United States. Um, so this one's a little more um, like higher level, but kind of the same type of um, considerations that need to be made um, in specific settings or specific um, types of facilities. And then shifting healthcare delivery modes. Um, it may not be possible with this group, but it does go under that as well. Um, I just want to speak a little bit to um, PPE supply. And I think um, as far as I, I don't know the whole background of everybody on the call, but um, if we're talking specifically long-term care facilities, um, many of you may not have a stockpile of N95 somewhere. Um, that's understandable. I think a lot, a lot of that may have gone away with um, H1N1 and if supplies, for whatever reason, you didn't use them and they're no longer there. Um, there is guidance for using um, N95 should you have them past their expiration. Um, there's guidance on extended use of those N95s and reuse of those N95s. Um, but however, um, if you don't have that, there is guidance. It's under the strategies for optimizing the supply of N95s. And if you click into there and you go all the way down to the bottom, um, there's um, other guidance that includes crisis and alternate strategies. Um, so that will um, go over how to uh, basically, um, when supplies are running low, if there's no respirator, uh, respirators left, different things that you can do. So we mentioned the past expiration date, extended use and reuse. Um, prioritizing healthcare personnel that have um, various 
conditions that may be more um, susceptible to, prioritizing them, um, and then excluding healthcare personnel that might be at um, greater risk. And then later down the line, maybe in a couple months or a year or so, um, those who have recovered from COVID-19 actually cohorting with patients who are, are ill. Um, the, the strategies for optimizing supply that has um, a bunch of different links to it, it'd be um, worth your time to probably just explore and just see what's, what's down there. I guess here in Michigan, um, we have to use what, what we have. So at the long-term care level, if it goes into more of a droplet precaution type range, we're using surgical masks, so that's what you have, that's what we're gonna have to, to use. So if you do have a ill person at your facility, um, if they need to be hospitalized, they would be going to an acute care facility that has um, those facilities. But um, if these are people's homes and whatnot, you have to use um, what you have available. Another option would be um, contacting um, your regional healthcare coalition and letting those folks know um, that you don't have any supplies. I know it's hard to get into the supply chain right now, um, but letting them know what you have and what you don't have, and that way they can um, prioritize resources in the, the region or the state if necessary, and um, just see how the epidemiology will drive which way our resources go. Stop there. Okay. You just you answered one of one of the questions that came up was um, a state response to having adequate PPE supplies for SNFs. So I think you sort of answered that already. And and my understanding is that the regional healthcare coalitions are um, maintaining kind of an idea of where the supplies are, what's available, and then prioritizing based on needs. And what's going on in the community in that particular community? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, good to know. Um, I have a couple of questions about people visiting. So one um, was about asking questions about should we be treating or doing something differently with employees who have planned vacations to areas that are known to be affected. Okay. That's, a, that's, that's a, a really good one. <laughs> I will defer to company policy. However, okay. I guess the caveat being, is, um, as we know and have heard, um, there's many conferences that are now being um, canceled. There's meetings that are being canceled. Um, I guess people could travel at their own risk, um, but just know when they come back if it is. They'll have to definitely check out what the travel advisory is and alert is for that, facility, that country, but I would just be very, very careful and monitor yourself when you come back and as far as illness and if it is that type of um, level two or higher area, I would definitely let the local health know when you return. Okay, thank you. There was another one in here about travel. Um, let me, oh, I just lost the questions. Hold on a second here. All right, so, um, and Larry, this might be something you can chime in. Again, I think this is mostly internal policy, but there's someone asking about family members coming in from out of state and wanting to sign residents out on a leave of absence and take them um, outside of the state and return. So again, sort of that vacation, you know, travel type thing. And I guess outside of, you know, taking into account travel re recommendations or travel limitation recommendations that are out there, maybe talking to the local public health departments to make sure that you have a good understanding of what um, the surrounding communities are experiencing. Um, any other suggestions or comments? Either For either of you, actually. Oh, Brian, I guess I would, these are very, very tricky. This might be like internal policy and procedure, but if I, if I were traveling and I were going to take my here somewhere, I would definitely look at um, that state's website or the CDC's website just to see, um, okay, say if it's a state that has not had any confirmed illness, I would definitely take my parent out. There, there's, n there's no confirmation there. Um, this is a, a respiratory illness. It's very uh, highly transmissible, but you could also go to Kroger and get influenza, or I could go to pick up a child at daycare and get norovirus. Those risks are always around us. So I would just check the, the local FBE, and if it's a state that doesn't have any cases right now, I would, I would just travel as normal. Okay. All right. 
Um, another question regarding visitors, questioning whether we need to maintain a, a log, taking temperatures and doing questionnaires. I, and I, I'm going to jump into this one a little bit. Actually, I'll be sharing um, a screening tool that you can use uh, a little bit later, had a call earlier today with Aka, and I have some more resources that I'll be able to share with members, including that. In the, on that discussion, um, this was actually one of the topics about taking temperatures. And the recommendation at this point in time is no, you do not need to take temperatures of every visitor as they're coming in the door. However, you should be doing active screening. And active screening does not mean that it needs to be a nurse. It doesn't mean that it needs to be somebody with a medical background, but they need to have just a list of questions um, that could be asked of those visitors as they, as they come to the, the facility. And really all it is is looking to find out if they've had travel recently in an area that's been affected and or are they having any kind of signs and symptoms. And it can simply be a, you know, a checklist or a, a list that that individual can ask them, you know, the temp, the cough, that sort of thing. So um, no, at this point in time, nobody is expecting anyone to take temperatures of everybody coming through the door or to maintain those logs, but you should consider how you are screening visitors as they come and go in the facilities. Oops, oh boy, here's a bunch. Um, and here's another, Brenda, this is one really for you. Most of the facilities do not have negative pressure airflow rooms. Um, by and large, most long-term care buildings do not have the capacity to provide care to true respiratory isolation. So the question came up is knowing that, are the N95s really um, pertinent? Um, so there is, in the guidance, if you go to the infection control frequently asked questions on CDC's um, webpage, there is a question, is airborne isolation required to evaluate patients with confirmed or those under investigation? So the answer is basically, if they need to be hospitalized or you need to do something with that patient, they should be in airborne isolation. But if not, they can be like source control. You can have a mask over that individual and put them in a room uh, where the room is not being recirculated without a HEPA filter and has at least normal, like six exchanges per hour or 12 if it's under construction. There are um, guidelines you can look up to see what that room is, but you can put that person in a room that is not an airborne isolation room okay. as long as they're source controlled. Okay, all right, another question. Um, regarding some symptom management. Question is, some patients may have residual symptoms such as coughing after hospitalization, and I'm going on the assumption that this would be an individual who had tested positive and had been hospitalized and is now ready for discharge. As a facility, are we still needing to be proactive in placing that resident in isolation until all residual sim symptoms completely subside? Um, I, I don't have the exact answer for that. I can tell you that um, there's guidance for the disposition of hospitalized patients. Um, that guidance is out there, and it goes to um, not letting that patient leave until symptom, there's a criteria, um, the fever resolved without medications, no more signs and symptoms. And according to CDC, um, their guidance is, I wanna say two pairs of negative OP, NP swab, two pairs taken uh, greater than 24 hours apart. However, that criteria is being um, reviewed based on Washington State's um, experience. So that's up for debate, and I don't know what that answer is, but there is some guidance out there, and um, we could always ask our, our clinical or MD partners for a more uh, specific answer than that. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to scroll through a couple, and we'll get to that one in a minute, okay, because there's one about survey, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, there is a question here about canceling, or if, if um, Michigan as a state is recommending canceling larger on-site events to the communities, such as having in, an on-site marketing, you know, a, a tour type of a deal, or a um, professional educational seminars, et cetera, that would be provided at a home. Um, I, and I, I guess I'll jump in again here first. I, you know, as Brenda shared, 
for the predominant population, this illness presents um, with cold type symptoms. It's not, fair, it's not a significant illness. However, for the population that we provide care for, it can be severe, it can be um, a life-threatening type of an illness. So I think you, it, it comes down to assessing what's going on in your community, assessing what it is that you are doing, and accept, assessing the risk that you might be posing to residents that are residing in, the, in that community where you might be hosting an event. Um, I, there's no hard, fast rules. It's a matter of common sense and, and looking at the, the bigger picture to make a decision. And I guess I'll ask if either of you have other thoughts to throw in there with that. Um, when CDC came out with their mass gathering guidance, I think a lot of people were looking for that answer. They wanted to know what's the formula. If I have you know X amount of cases here, how and when do I cancel these? And I don't think... Um, there's going to be a hard, fast rule, at least from the federal level. I think it might come down to that at the state level at some point, and you would definitely hear about that, but as of right now, with no um, confirmed cases in the state, um, you would really have to take all into account what, uh, what Kathy mentioned, just the local epi, what you're doing, the population that's going to attend, um, where is that, and whatnot. So we have had a lot of those questions come in, and it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis right now until the epi changes. Okay. All right. Let's um, switch focus for a little bit and I'd like to welcome Larry Horvath and see what he can share from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, this is Larry Horvath with the um, Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs Bureau of Community Health Systems. So first, on behalf of the department, I uh, want to thank you guys for what you guys do on the front line every day. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk about a few things um, from a state licensing standpoint. So this would include uh, nursing homes, homes for the aged and adult foster care. Um, we are currently continuing with our surveys um, according to state regulations. So there has been no reduction in survey activities. Uh, we will continue with those. On a federal standpoint, from those that are nursing homes that are federally certified uh, to participate in Medicare and Medicaid, uh, we will be doing a reduction in survey work. Um, this information should have been shared uh, earlier with you, but we will be reducing the number of surveys. Uh, we don't know when the time period will, how long this will extend out. At this point in time, there's no definitive end date. Um, but what we are looking in is prioritizing our surveys to immediate jeopardy complaints, complaints alleging infection control concerns, uh, statutorily required recertification surveys, any revisit necessary to resolve enforcement actions, initial surveys for new providers, and surveys of providers that had a history of infection control control uh, deficiencies at the uh, immediate jeopardy level in the last three years. All other surveys will be suspended at this time from a federal standpoint. Um, for the most part, there, so there will be a reduction in on-site present for our team. Um, I would um, continue to ask that you still uh, re report uh, facility reported incidents as required. Uh, we will triage those and look at those to see if they meet any of the high priorities set forth by CMS. Um, we are still waiting for guidance from CMS on how we will handle uh, those uh, facility reported incidents or complaints after this is lifted, how we will handle those investigations. Uh, when our staff are on site, uh, we ask that you assist us if we are in need of any protective gear, uh, but we want to make sure that you understand that we expect your protective gear first to go to your staff, uh, making sure that your staff providing those services are, are protected. Um, the likelihood of us needing supplies will be probably very small. Um, there may be, you know, ask for maybe gloves, hand sanitizer, 
um, maybe a mask. Uh, we are ordering those supplies because these are things we routinely don't bring out. Uh, we are not asking for any of the masks like the N95s. Those will all be handled by the state if they're necessary or, or full protective suits. Uh, so again, uh, our, our request for protective gear when we're on site will be very limited. Um, they will be more common things that we would routinely see. Um, we would ask you to take this time um, to revisit your emergency preparedness plans uh, to make sure that your emergency preparedness plans are addressing if you have an outbreak, any type of uh, flu-like uh, illness outbreaks, um, that you should re revisit your emergency preparedness plans to make sure that they're up to date. We also ask that, uh, again, you promote and uh, with your staff, your visitors, um, recommendations for self-limiting to access to the building. Uh, so again, about visitors and keeping logs and everything of that nature, one is we do want to emphasize that you, you promote that for staff as well as visitors just to uh, self-limit themselves if they have either been in a high-risk area exposed or showing, showing symptoms themselves. A um, couple of other uh, items is just, you know, uh, we would also ask you not only to promote that self-limiting awareness message, uh, but also promote good hygiene practice reminders to the staff and those that are coming into the facilities. Um, at this point in time, I think that's where I will stop and see if there's any additional questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, we do have some questions I think you can help with. One um, is in regard to nurse aid training. So for Facilities who are sites for nurse aid training clinical um, practicums, questioning whether there should be any alternative arrangements um, or changes in the agreements to have the students there on site. At this point in time, we have no recommendations. We would recommend that the on-site trainings continue on. Um, but if, if there is a reason of concern, I would ask that you reach out to our office directly and then we will work with you to make sure that we can accommodate any way we can. But at this point in time, we think that obviously um, continuing to train and get you the staff that you need to deliver the services is important. The hands-on experience, um, having those uh, nurse aides training during a time where we have high vigilance on these types of potential outbreaks would be excellent training. Um, Re-emphasizing to them the good hygiene practices. So, um, but if there is concern, reach out to us directly. Okay. Thank you. Um, question on joint provider surveyor training: If there's been any consideration for either a um, virtual format or canceling? Uh, we are in discussions at this point in time, so we do hope to have an announcement soon. Uh, we are looking at the potential to cancel us since we are talking about 800 providers, um, obviously serving a high-risk population. Um, we are looking at alternative meth um, methods such as maybe making some of the sessions available um, during um, maybe some type of WebEx. Uh, so we hope to have an announcement here shortly within either this week or early next week on that. I think we're about um, probably about five weeks out, four weeks out from that. but. Uh, we should have some guidance here shortly. Okay. All right, a couple more here, um, and I'm not necessarily going to do these in order. Uh, first off, there's a question about um, chain of command as far as contact and asking if there, for some reason, if there's clarifications that are needed on things such as the, the nurse aid training or things like that. Do you want them to contact your office, or should they be going through the survey managers first and then on up? They, if there is a, uh, so this is Larry, uh, if there is a change in the uh, nursing home administrator and the nursing, uh, nursing home um, director of nursing, uh, we ask you to continue to notify us of those changes via our website, which basically requires an email. That will allow us to keep our database up to date. That way, if we have to send out any alerts, um, that we are making sure that we are um, sending out the alerts to the appropriate administrators and directors of nursing and that we have the most current 
uh, email addresses for them. So continue to use the uh, guidance on our website that talks about a change in administrator or director of nursing. It is a simple email uh, process that, that keeps our database active. Thank you. All right, couple sur couple more survey questions. Um, first off, from an AL or AFC perspective, would, uh, should those members or individuals expect any change in survey activity? At this point in time, there's uh, there has been no change in survey activities for adult foster care, adult state licensed adult foster care or homes for the aged. Again, we would encourage uh, both those provider types to once again uh, visit their emergency preparedness plan uh, to make sure, uh, heighten their awareness about uh, self-limiting staff and uh, visitors to the facility, um, and, and also uh, taking, taking stock of uh, the necessary protective gear that they may need for staff. Um, obviously, if, if an individual is showing signs or symptoms, we would ask that they reach out immediately to the uh, uh, appropriate healthcare practitioner. Um, but at this point in time, uh, routine surveys will continue to go on um, as, as um, currently scheduled. Uh, keeping in mind that we do not license uh, assisted living in the state of Michigan, uh, so we have no oversight for assisted living. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, two more survey questions. On um, facilities that are currently awaiting revisit, there's a question whether there will be um, any um, consideration given to doing a desk review versus an on-site given these changes. Yes, so desk reviews are being promoted and highly encouraged. Um, Michelle has been working with the healthcare teams uh, to um, once again emphasize, even without this, we are trying to do more desk reviews, but in this, um, obviously because our, our, our guidance from CMS is the higher priority activities, if we can do it in a desk review, we're gonna do it in a desk review to close out. Uh, the enforcement cycles, um, or to close out any open cases, uh, open any open cycles. Okay. Um, are special focus facilities affected by the survey priority at all? That is actually an excellent question that nobody has asked, and uh, <laughs> so actually I need to go back because obviously special focus facilities are on a higher scrutiny uh, for resurvey, uh, so. At this point in time, CMS has not addressed that, but I will immediately go back to the office and ask about that. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Um, question on FRIES. Uh, understanding the limitations um, from a survey standpoint, but knowing that providers still need to be reporting anything reportable, the question is, is, is there any additional information or um, narrative comments, details, et cetera, that should be included on a FRI that will help the department to be able to review and prioritize and, and hopefully desk review a FRI rather than result in an on-site? Yeah, so what I, I would uh, ask that you do is keeping in mind what we are looking for is anything that has an immediate jeopardy to it, anything that has infection control concerns. Um, so in the narrative, maybe up front, putting the narrative that this fry uh, does not appear to have any immediate jeopardy risk or infection control risk will help us uh, quicker triage that if we see that immediately up front on that fry. Uh, we are still going to have to look at each fry and the narratives, um, but that will allow us to kind of, uh, you guys are healthcare experts. Uh, licensed providers, so uh, we do trust uh, you guys when you give this, so your evaluation up front will be very helpful to help us streamline that process. Okay. Um, Larry, I'm going to have you circle back to one of the earlier questions for a moment on the um, contact information. For questions or um, concerns regarding COVID-19 in a facility response or um, whatever the case may be, when they need to contact um, Lara in general, would you want that contact starting with the survey manager versus coming to 
the Lansing office? Uh, yes, I would. If it is for COVID-19 specifically, I would still reach out to the survey manager, your applicable survey manager, or your licensing consultant for those that are adult foster care and uh, homes for the age. Uh, reach out to them, but alert them that uh, this is specific to COVID-19 and there are concerns. And those uh, managers are well aware that they are to escalate those concerns to the Lansing office immediately. And then we will get in coordination with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the lead agency for this. Okay. Um, just want to clarify, there's a question in here on reporting COVID-19. Yes, it is it is expected to be reported to the local health department and they should be involved with testing as well. So if your medical provider suspects an individual and is considering doing testing, they should be contacting and coordinating with your local health department first and foremost. As far as COVID-19 being a reportable as a facility reported incident, it is not considered a fry. That is correct. Thank you. All right, and this, Brenda, I'm gonna take this question back to you. Um, there's a question, at what point do we suspect COVID-19 instead of influenza? Should we test for both or test for flu first? Um, so it's more of a, a clinical question, but I would say if you have an individual who does present with um, symptoms that are compatible with COVID-19 and they've had a respiratory panel and those are all negative, and they've had exposure or recent travel to a facility, uh, country that is um, a level two or higher. Um, so we're talking um, China, Italy, Iran, um, South Korea, if they've had that type of exposure or have been in contact with somebody who has had travel, um, that would definitely be higher on my, my level of suspicion. Um, they could definitely always call the local health department and they could walk them through all the criteria and see uh, what they think. Okay. Now I think we've caught all of the questions that are in the chat box at this point in time. I'm just going to do a quick double check. Um, are there any other questions that folks have that we can answer at this point? Those are and Kathy, this is Larry from the department. So one thing we would want to stress is if they're unsure, just pick up the phone and reach out to either the Department of Health and Human Services, the local health department. We would ask them to start with local health department if it's specific to COVID-19, but always pick up the phone and reach out to us. We will get them to the right individual. Good, thank you. Um, before we cut off, and it, it doesn't look like there's any further questions at this point in time, but before I cut off, I just want to um, share a little bit of information and make sure you know where you can find things as well. Brenda shared a great deal of information, and as she, as, as she said, the CDC website is probably your, your most comprehensive source of information about um, the COVID-19 virus and how to screen, respond, what types of PPE, all of those types of questions. One of the things that we've done is we've added a web page to our website, the hcam.org. There's a link on the home page there that will take you to a coronavirus page. We have links to the CDC website. We have links to CMS materials. We have all of the updates that have come out from ACA and from ourselves there, including a, a great deal of resources. Many of them you will also find on the CDC website. Um, but some other resources that we've been sharing. Two things that I, as I shared earlier today, that will be up there shortly is, one is kind of a checklist that you can go through and it has spaces to put that contact information in so you know exactly who to pick up the phone and call and ask for if you need to reach your local health department, you need to reach the, the emergency response um, department your hospital contacts, EMS, things like that, and it walks through um, screening, what to do with employees, some question and answers, that sort of thing. And I, it's a quick, easy format. So I'll have that out for you soon, and I will also have a screening tool available that you can use if you'd like for screening visitors. Again, um, just a very simple, I think it's really just a matter of asking questions and making sure 
um, that you understand if you can identify individuals who have traveled or who are at high risk for potentially being positive and spreading um, the illness if they come into the building. So, outside of any other questions, um, yep. Um, with that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Melissa and let her say a few more things. If I just want to thank, I want to thank both um, Brenda and Larry for taking the time to join us today. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to to call in and, and uh, get the updates. Let me just say that information will continue to come fast and furious. You know, we have not had a confirmed case in Michigan, but I think we're all anticipating that. And I, I think as that happens, um, you know, certainly what happens here in Michigan will ramp up and information will um, I think start to come out even at, at a more accelerated rate. These these documents that Kathy has mentioned, one of the um, kind of unique things about what's happening here is that obviously there's 50 of us across the state, so there's 50 uh, state affiliates uh, across the country that you know some experience a, a more higher um, impact of this than others. Certainly, the state of Washington, the state executive out of Washington has um, almost on a daily basis been sharing information with other state affiliates um, and helping us prepare as it does move across the country. The, the, the guideline checkoff that Kathy is talking about was specifically prepared by the state of Washington with their local and state health departments um, in conjunction with long-term care providers. So I think it's, a, it's an excellent tool the visitor toolkit um, that we are going to modify for a Michigan version is out of the state of Florida where they do have um, confirmed cases. So I think that will continue to unfold for us again across the country, some states being more heavily impacted by others. And we will certainly be, you know, taking all of this information from our state affiliates and, and you know, picking the best, I think, tools that we can bring forward here in Michigan to get out to you to try to stay ahead of the, the curve on this as far as what we are providing to you as far as useful resources. So just continue to look at that and, and we will be putting it out and then ultimately it will be all housed back on the HCAM website along with again all of the other information and materials that we are putting out to you. The last thing I'll say is that as we progress with this um, and as it unfolds in the state of Michigan, certainly if we feel at all that another conference call is warranted between our government officials and our members, we certainly um, will be scheduling that. I, I can't imagine that we won't be having another conference call uh, just to have the opportunity for you to ask questions. So. Uh, please look for that um, again in the coming days and weeks as we as we move forward. So again, thank you, everybody. If if you if you did call in and weren't able to submit your question through the webinar, please again send that to info at hcam.org. We will look at all of those questions as well, and then combine both the questions <laughs> asked today and answered with those that would be sent to our info at hcam.org email. We'll put all of that together, the whole Q&A, and um, put that back out to you on the website along with a recording of today's conference call. So thank you again, everybody.